Here on The Secret Sits, we are digging into all forms of true crime, and I know that all of us root for a survivor, a hero or a heroine to themselves or to others around them. It gives us some sort of relief from the gruesomeness and horrid things happening all around us. It also gives us hope that if somehow, one day, we find ourselves in one of these senseless situations, we can recall the story of a true badass survivor and let it be our guiding light out of our own darkness. Today, we are going to talk about the survival and fortitude of Mary Vincent. It was September 29, 1978. 15-year-old Las Vegas resident Mary Vincent was hitchhiking in the San Francisco Bay Area and traveling down Interstate 5 toward Los Angeles. Now, this is the 70s, and hitchhiking is very commonplace during this time, something we would never do today. There were two other hitchhikers on the side of the road with Mary when a blue van stopped, close to the hitchhikers. The man inside was 51-year-old Larry Singleton. Now, even though the hitchhikers could see into the van and could clearly see it was completely empty, Larry said he only had room for one of the three hitchhikers. This weirded out the other two hitchhikers and both told Mary not to take the ride. However, Mary, being 15 years old and an experienced hitchhiker in the 70s, she looked at the old man and decided he looked like a kind old grandpa and took the ride anyway. Larry told Mary he was a merchant seaman. I looked it up, and this is a person who works on a boat to transport goods across lakes, rivers, or other bodies of water and he just needed to make one last stop at his house in San Pablo, and then they would head toward Interstate 5. They drove to his house and everything was fine. They then started driving to Interstate 5. Mary was very tired from hitchhiking and decided that she would take a nap. And I say, Mary, don't do that. You don't know this man. Don't sleep in his van when he takes you who knows where. So... Mary sleeps for a while, and when she wakes up, she notices that all the road signs are the wrong direction from where they were supposed to be going, and Larry was headed towards Nevada instead of LA. Mary immediately became upset and said something to Larry about him driving in the wrong direction. Larry just played it off and just said he made a mistake and that he was happy to turn around. So Larry turned around and they proceeded south on Interstate 5. This is where we hope that our instincts for self-preservation kick in and we at the very least become hyper-observant of the situation we are now in. After heading down Interstate 5 for a while, Larry says he needs to relieve himself. He gets out of the van to go relieve himself and Mary has a sinking feeling in her stomach. At this point, she looks down at her shoes and notice that one of her shoes is untied. She decides to step out of the van to tie her shoe, knowing that if something was wrong and she needed to make a break for it, she would need her shoes to be tied. Well, the shoes being tied didn't really matter, because as soon as Mary is out of the van and bends over to tie her shoe, she is suddenly met with a blinding pain. Larry has smashed Mary across the head with a sledgehammer. He also starts to punch her in the head and back with his fists until she stops moving. Mary is unconscious and most likely has a massive concussion at this point. So Larry picks Mary up and carries her to the back of his van and throws her inside. Larry gets back into the van and drives further down the road to an isolated area just next to the drop-off of a canyon wall. When Mary wakes up, her hands had been tied to opposite walls in the van so she could not escape. Larry then begins the all-night torturous rape and sodomy of Mary Vincent. Mary pleaded with him to let her go and set her free. Larry then forced Mary to drink something which 
caused her to pass out. By this time, Larry had raped Mary at least six times that she can remember. When Mary wakes up, she once again is pleading with Larry to let her go and set her free. Finally, Larry responds to Mary's pleas and says, If you want to be set free, I'll set you free. And he takes a hatchet from his toolbox and promptly cuts off Mary's left hand. The arm is severed halfway between her wrist and elbow. Terrified, Mary starts to scream and grabs Larry's arm with her right hand. So Larry takes the hatchet and swings at Mary's right arm. He lands the blow with the hatchet, but it did not cleanly cut off her right hand like it had her left. So he just kept chopping until Mary's right arm also comes off. At this point, Mary is in shock, mentally and physically, I'm sure, and she looks over at Larry and sees him flicking his arm out into the air. She couldn't really put together what was happening until she saw the whole picture and realized that her hand Larry had just chopped off was still holding on to his arm, and he was flicking his arm, trying to make it let go. At this point, Mary is weak from shock and blood loss, and so Larry picks her up and carries her over to the canyon wall and just throws her body over the wall, which is a 30-foot drop. He then shouts down to her, There, you are free now. Mary never lost consciousness at the bottom of this 30-foot drop-off, and Larry Singleton just drove away, believing Mary was dead or soon would be. What he didn't know was that Mary Vincent was a 15-year-old badass. Mary is completely naked and covered in blood. She has four broken ribs from her fall. She realizes that she is in big trouble and will likely bleed to death quickly, so she does what she can to stay alive. First, she takes both of her severed arm stumps and presses them hard into the mud and dirt around her to form a mud pack on the wounds to try to stop her arms from bleeding. Next, she has to get out of the canyon Larry has thrown her into. She spends the entire day slowly crawling military style up the 30-foot wall back to the interstate. It was so dark and she was in an unmeasurable amount of pain but she could hear traffic on the road above her, and she knew this was her only chance to survive. Finally, after hours of climbing, Mary reaches the road above her. She raises her arms above her head so that the muscles and blood would not fall out of her body. So just imagine this scene. Mary is 15 years old and completely naked covered in her own blood, head to toe, and is now also covered in dirt and mud from her climb up this canyon. Holding her now two stumps for arms above her head as she walks down the interstate, hoping for someone to drive by and help her. Now, would you stop for this girl in this situation? Mary walks down the interstate for hours without a single car passing. Finally, a red convertible drove down the road. The occupants inside end up being two young guys, and when they get a closer look at Mary, they completely freak out and drive off without her. Mary walks another three miles before another car appears. This time, it is a young couple who were on their honeymoon and had gotten lost. They wrap Mary's arms in towels and put her in the car and speed off to the nearest phone booth. The couple calls for help and a helicopter is dispatched to pick up Mary from the interstate. Mary spent a month in the hospital recovering from her injuries, but she was determined to make sure that Larry was caught. She gave police a very detailed description, which the police used to make a sketch of Larry. The police sketch was seen by one of Larry's neighbors, who called the police. 
Now this neighbor had known Larry for years and immediately knew it was him. This neighbor was listed in the newspapers as a housewife and bowling expert. Police went to Larry's house in San Pablo and did a search. There they found Mary's cigarettes and remnants of burnt clothing, which also appeared to be Mary's. Larry, with the help of one of his neighbors, had already cleaned his van. Damn, one neighbor unwittingly helps him clean up his crime and another one turned him in. Larry told police that he picked up Mary and after that, he picked up two male hitchhikers named Larry and Pedro. Larry said that they stopped at a bar and smoked some dope, and then he paid to have sex with Mary. See if he can make her look like a sex worker. Instead of just a runaway teen, the police will marginalize her and not care as much. Larry claims that he passed out after that, and Larry, the other Larry, drove the van to San Francisco. He saw Mary's clothes in the van, but she was gone when he woke up. He completely denied attacking and raping her. Mary testified at Larry's trial and had to sit no more than 10 to 15 feet across from him and recount every explicit detail of what he had done to her on that night. She identified Larry Singleton as her attacker. After her testimony, she could only leave the courtroom by passing directly next to where Larry was sitting. And as she walked past him, he looked at Mary and said, I'll finish the job if it takes the rest of my life. The jury found him guilty, and Larry was convicted of kidnapping, mayhem, attempted murder, forcible rape, sodomy, and forced oral copulation. He received the maximum sentence for his crimes, which was 14 years and 4 months. And I know you are all thinking, how can this be? Well, that was due to the fact that at the time, judges could not impose consecutive sentences for each felony like they can now. The judge in this case remarked, if I had the power, I would send him to prison for the rest of his natural life. Mary also won a civil judgment against Singleton for $2.56 million, which she could never collect, as it turned out Singleton was unemployed and only had $200 in his savings. Mary's nightmare didn't end with his conviction. The brutal nature of this crime and her young age combined to change her life forever. Mary went on to get married and have two sons, but she found it hard to even leave the house for even mundane tasks, and she found it impossible to keep a job. She was in constant fear. Mary said, He destroyed everything about me, my way of thinking, my way of life, holding on to innocence and I'm still doing everything I can to hold on. When Mary was 15 years old, her dream was to be a dancer at the Lido du Paris, a show running at the Stardust Casino in Las Vegas. It is said she was a talented dancer and probably could have made it, but the doctors had to take parts out of her leg to save the rest of her arms and so she could never dance again. Mary began using prosthetic arms within two weeks after her attack. As someone who likes to tinker with things, Mary had used spare parts from broken down electronics to modify her prosthetics into custom designs. After her attack, she began making art and she attended UNLV in Las Vegas. Larry spent the next few years in prison working and helping others and earning good behavior merits. And because of this, they paroled the psycho after just seven years and nine months. So this was such a big news story. It had gotten nationwide attention. And when they went to parole Larry Singleton, town after town in California refused to allow him to move there. 
and Rodeo, about 25 miles northeast of San Francisco, a crowd of about 500 protesters showed up, and officers were forced to move him from a hotel room under armed guards. He was removed from one apartment in Contra Costa County in a bulletproof vest after 400 residents surrounded the building to protest a decision to place him there permanently. After being rejected from most towns in California, the state had to place a trailer on the grounds of the San Quentin prison for Singleton to live in while on parole for one year. After his parole was completed, Larry ended up in Orient Park, Florida. This is close to Tampa. He had registered with the state authorities as a convicted felon because it was required by law to do so. But local law enforcement did not have to notify his neighbors of his past. Nobody in the area knew who he was. That all changed on February 19th, 1997. A house painter was painting a house nearby and happened to look into the window of Larry's home. He saw a horrific scene, and it was happening in real time, directly in front of him. The painter called the police and told them what he had seen, a naked man covered in blood, repeatedly stabbing a naked woman on his sofa. He said that he could hear bones being crushed with each blow. Police arrived at the home and found that Larry was the naked man covered in blood. The woman was 31-year-old Roxanne Hayes. She was a mother of three and a sex worker. She had agreed to meet Larry at his home for $20. Even though Mary Vincent was still suffering with PTSD from her attack, she wanted to testify at Singleton's murder trial so that Roxanne could get some justice. Mary told the jury once again every detail about what Larry had done to her. I was raped. I had my arms cut off. He used a hatchet. He left me to die, she told the jury. It took the jury four hours to reach a verdict of guilty. Larry was given the death penalty, but sadly, he died in jail on December 28, 2001, of cancer. The outrage at Larry Singleton's sentence for the crimes committed against Mary Vincent led to the Singleton Bill, which makes cases involving torture carry a minimum 25-year-to-life sentence. Mary now works with chalk pastels to create powerfully upbeat women, like female action figures, she also draws family and individual portraits on commission. Her customized prosthetics are also self-creations, including a custom prosthetic for bowling. So Mary Vincent is a survivor, and because of that, she can let us in on her own secrets. Mary said, He threw me off a cliff. I should have broken bones. I should have bled to death. I didn't, and I never passed out. I remember everything. I wanted to give up and go to sleep, but I felt someone there with me, a presence who wanted me to survive. A voice told me to get up and get help, or someone else would die. After this incident, her parents came to get her, but were, in her opinion, never much help. They couldn't handle it, she said. They took it harder than me. I'm telling them, I need you. But they couldn't do it. They were more interested in what they felt about what happened to me than what I felt. And her nightmares are still there. She's still afraid to go to sleep and can't sleep for long. Mary said, I've broken bones thanks to my nightmares. I've jumped up and dislocated my shoulder, just trying to get out of bed. I've cracked my ribs and smashed my nose. 
Every day I pray to God to make a space I can breathe in. And every day God gives it to me. So let that be our focus for this week. Surviving at all costs. Because your survival could also save countless other lives. But we also need to be there for survivors. And we need to help them obtain the correct therapy to get them through the bad times. And sometimes, all they need to get through their bad times is a space they can breathe in. I'm John Dodson, and this has been The Secret Sits. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original artwork provided by Tony Leigh.